It's absolutely beautiful to watch our children go to be raised up to become discipled warriors. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to ask you, if you would, to pray with me as we begin. This is a day that uh, I've already seen the Lord's hand so active and so present. I want to begin by just giving him glory. Would you join me, please? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you are doing in and through us. What a blessed people we are. Little more than ants or mosquitoes at your picnic, and yet you give us such honor, such privilege to be your ambassadors. Lord, I pray that you will get every distraction, everything that would interfere with your sharing and touching of truth and love. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing in your sight. May you receive all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I want to share with you a message today that is entitled, The Stairway to Heaven. The stairway to heaven. And my prayer is that as we come together under the teaching and the preaching of God's word, that none of us will ever leave here or this time the same. I pray that God will do what only he can do as a demonstration of his amazing grace and love With that said, I'd like to begin by asking you a question. I want to ask you a question that has a single word answer, but it fills two answer slots. One word answers two questions. Those two questions are, what do you believe was and is the biggest problem in the professing church? What do you believe was all the way back to Jesus' days and still is today the biggest problem in the professing church? And question number two. Remember, one word fills both answers. What do you think is and was the greatest potential in the professing church? So what was the biggest problem and what was the biggest potential? What is the biggest problem and what is the biggest potential in the professing church? While you think about it, let me remind you of the context. We're in 1 Peter, a sermon series entitled No Matter What. Peter writing through the inspiration of God. So this is God speaking because it's God's word. He's speaking to the people in modern day Turkey who were scattered as the early professing Christians. Now let me give you a little bit of additional context that's not obvious, but it's important. Peter is in part writing to the exact same people that the book of Hebrews was written to. Those who were the professing church scattered now under persecution in difficult times. It's also the exact same people that Jesus spoke to and wrote to in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. We know it as the seven churches that received the seven letters from Christ. That might help you with your answer. What was and still is the greatest problem in the church professing? What is and was the greatest potential in the professing church? The answer is faith. The answer is faith. Yes, faith. Because with a lack of it, everything else that is wrong occurs. With a lack of biblical faith, every other sin and problem occurs. With it, with biblical faith, 
You'll see before we're done, God ushers in amazing grace and everything else that comes in the potential and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that said, my heart's desire today is to give you a very teaching-oriented sermon that will illuminate for you and me from God's word the stairway to heaven. The gracious, amazing, miraculous stairway to heaven. And you and I will see, I pray, before we're done, that that stairway to heaven is climbed by individual steps of faith all day, every day, until we get to what we've been promised by the God of the Word, our inheritance in heaven. And we climb those steps with a living hope per the promise and the power of the living God. Now, as we go, I need you to understand that this is going to be a war. It's an absolute war on the stairway. And the war involves all kinds of deception, dilution, destruction. But make no mistake, there is a stairway that goes to heaven. And it is made up of steps of faith. That you and I, if you're a believer, we can climb by the grace of God and for the glory of God. The timeless truth for today, I pray you'll never forget this. Biblical faith is both a root and a fruit issue. You can't get this faith from anyone or any place else but the living God. It is a fruit issue of the Spirit of God. When he indwells the believer, he gives them faith that no one and nothing can ever take away. And where and when that faith is truly connected to the root that is Christ, Christ-like fruit will follow. Not out of hard, burdening effort, but it's because that root bears that fruit. This is a simple, eternal truth that must be understood. Because if you're putting your faith in anything but that gospel truth, it's a faulty faith. I want to begin by sharing with you a perspective from Eric Ludi, a voice many of you will know, a face few have seen. I want to introduce you to Eric Ludi as he helps to explain the problem. In our day, we are seeing prominent Christian personalities falling like fruit from trees, denouncing their faith. I was a Christian, but I'm not a Christian anymore. They were never a Christian if they're not a Christian now. You've got to understand the power and the role and the purpose of faith to rightly understand where and how fact and faith and fruit and feelings fit and don't fit in the gospel's truth and love. Watch this and then we'll come back and get ready. We're going to go through a lot of scripture because you need to be grounded in the truth and not your feelings. Watch this, and then we'll come right back. I think many of the Christians that have been sort of fading uh, in, in the leadership, key leadership positions that have faded and lost their, whether it's their zeal or their, their passion for Christ or lost their, their belief system altogether, I think it shows a root system. Uh, it's, you know, as Jesus talks about the, the parable of the, soil and soils, and you see that there are certain things that are dead giveaways that there was never a healthy root system that, that did not take hold and, and dig deep. There were different things that choked it off. And I would say we're lacking an understanding of suffering. Very simply put, I think it probably is, I could almost center it on that. 
Because when you grow up in America, you don't deal with the difficulties that other Christians, when they first come out of the spiritual birth canal, they are dealing with huge issues, life-death issues. In America, you can just coast your way through for most of it, and you can become famous, and you can write a book, you can have uh, albums, and you can just feel good and get tons of money, and you get a false rendition of Christianity. That's not how it's worked throughout the ages. Christians are held in contempt. Even the word Christian itself was a slur word when it came out. In other words, there's, it's never been a popularity thing. It has been a Jesus thing. And so as a result, without the idea of suffering, suffering is part and parcel. Do not consider it strange, my brethren, when you face trials of many kinds. And guess what? Modern day Christians think it's strange when they face trials. And so you'll see a root system tested when the trial comes. When the trial comes and a man suddenly turns on God and says, God, how could you allow this to happen to me? That man was not built properly. He was not built on the word of God. He was built on a social ideal of Christianity. So he picked and chose what he wanted out of Christianity and not what God said. Because God says you will face difficulties in this life. God made it very clear that you're a sheep among wolves. God made it very clear that this world will not like you <laughs> because it didn't like him. You are a light shining in a dark place. Expect the same treatment that came towards Jesus to come towards you. But then God builds the saints that understand this to be solid so that when it comes, we turn to him. We don't turn against him. We turn to him and get grace, and it makes us stronger. So someone who understands suffering actually becomes stronger through difficulty. Someone who doesn't understand it falls to pieces during difficulty. So I believe as the heat is being turned up on Christianity, it's exposing root systems right now. And our desire at any point in time, no matter where you're at right now, if you feel like you have a thin root system, God loves to take root systems and begin to deepen them. He wants you to be solid so that when winds and rains beat against your house, you'll stand strong. I pray that that hits you in the heart in a way that doesn't knock you over but lifts you up. This is truth and love. I pray that you understand this is why here at the bridge, my language, our bridge language, we're looking for fat people. We're looking for fat people all the time. Faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. Because all good things will come from that place. And without it, there's, dare I say, there isn't any hope. There isn't any hope. There's placebos. There's masks. There's charades. There are goats. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. This is why it's so important that we understand. We understand. I, I want to walk with you through what could be a, a summary. Isaiah 7, 9. I wonder if you're familiar with this verse. If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. We've taught our children growing up, if you don't know what you stand for, you'll lay down for just about anything. This is the word of God. Again, biblical faith is both a root, it must come through Christ and his gospel, and it is a fruit issue. You will know them by their fruit, says Jesus. Real faith lives out the love of Christ. Not perfectly, but passionately. At the time we have today, I want to walk with you through a biblical understanding of faith defined, faith described, and faith deployed. And you'll find here at the heart, this is the essence of the great commandments and the great commission put together. And so I ask you, please, let the word of God wash over you and apply this truth in love. It's Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith defined. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Note, faith lives where sight is blind. You don't need to see. It's beyond your senses and your feelings. Faith comes 
by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Martin Luther said, faith is a living and unshakable confidence, a belief in God so assured that a man would die a thousand deaths for his faith. We see where we've been in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 7 thus far. In here we're told that by faith you and I we receive a living hope. I wonder if you've thought about your faith in the terms of it being a living hope. Now that's not the fullness of it, that's the seed of it. And wait till you see how beautifully faith grows And faith does grow. The disciples prayed and asked Jesus, would you please grow our faith? We know as well that faith focuses on quality and not quantity. If you have faith as little as a mustard seed, it's enough because it's about the quality and not the quantity of your faith. Do you know that Mark 9, 23 tells us, again, God's word, not mine, that all things are possible through faith. Well, pastor, you don't understand how bad it is. Well, I understand the Bible, and apparently you don't, because God says all things are possible in and through faith. Faith defines and empowers new life. How many of you are familiar with Galatians 2.20, right? I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I'm crucified with Christ. You know the verse ends and says, the new life I live, I live by faith. Faith empowers daily living. Faith is an overcoming victory. How many of you know this? 1 John 5, 4. Faith is victory. God's word. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith is is victory. Faith is God's conduit for healing. Mark 10, 52, your faith has made you well. Faith is God's shield. You know the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, 16. A shield of faith per God that can and will put out all the flaming arrows of the enemy. How do you like knowing that faith serves as a perfect shield All the arrows. Faith is proven in action. Faith lives. James 2.17, for faith without works is dead. Show me a faith that is in word alone, an absence of the fruit, and I'll show you a dead, faulty faith. A faith that is in someone or something else. These are in Incredibly important truths to understand. When we define faith biblically, listen to what we heard in verse 5 of 1 Peter 1. I'll go back to verse 4. Your inheritance, is it, it's imperishable, it's undefiled, it will not fade. It's reserved or kept in heaven for you. You who are protected by the power of God, you are protected by the power of God through faith. No faith, no protection. Your faith is what brings to you the protective power of God. How important is it that you and I understand biblically what is faith and what your feelings will take away? When you trust Anything else but the biblical truth, the biblical definitions, the biblical descriptions. Let me show you. This biblical faith, you're protected by the power of God through faith. What's that going to look like? I'll tell you what, it's going to look like you are rock solid. Doesn't mean you're going to be neat and polished. You probably look like you've been to hell and back. But you'll stand immovable. By faith. Again, let me ask Eric Ludy to help us understand. Brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know that it's a command in the New Testament to be immovable? It's a command. Be immovable. 
Everything in this world will be moved, everything. There is one thing that will last, and that is truth. But we must be built upon a true, solid foundation. What you're building on is not just text, theory, good ideas, and human philosophies. You're building upon the efficacy, the power, the authority of Jesus. It's a person. You are standing on him. Anything fixed to that person will last with him. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. God is likened to a rock. His word is likened to a rock. And a rock doesn't change from generation to generation. It's like, oh, I just really want to be climbed upon. You know, and if I don't have to look in this generation, then they might not like me. Rocks don't care about that. And you know what? God isn't attempting to win a popularity contest. He just is who he is. He's not gonna change to match our likes and dislikes. He is. Let's get it straight. God does not alter. God does not shape shift. God's truth is a reflection of who he is. And in it is no shadow of turning, just like him. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Christians, well, they're the same yesterday, today and forever. You see, he has given us everything we need to behave as we ought to behave. So as a result, we can be as he is, though we are not as he is, by our nature and the way we are outside of him, we can be as he is when we turn unto him and he fills us with his grace. And he enables us to live lives that otherwise would be impossible. God stabilizes our life. He takes us from going up and down and all over the place to suddenly, boom, he rivets us. He drills us in to his bedrock. And he begins to build us the way his nature is revealed in scripture. And he says, no more are you a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. Get to know the power of Jehovah and he will stabilize your life and he will build you as rock. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He, meaning the righteous, shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Do you know how often we get evil tidings? They come through television, they come through newspapers, they come through whispers and conversations around you, they come through emails, and they come and they can actually renovate our perspective. It's amazing, but you could be in a great mood, feeling wonderful about life, and an evil tiding can come and completely destroy your life. What's funny is your life is the exact same as it was, but an evil tiding came in and warped your worldview. And now suddenly you're under the weight of this ridiculous thing. It's petty, it is, but it's controlling you. You've been bullied around by evil tidings for far too long in your life. You know what you do when an evil tiding comes? You leap for joy. What do we do? We leap for joy. The world could collapse for all we care, but our God's not going anywhere. If we live with integrity, we have nothing to fear, no matter how loud they shout. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect, precious. Now listen closely. He that believes on him shall not be confounded. To be put to shame is what this means. To be disgraced, to have hope meet with failure. This is what we're afraid of. And this is what the enemy says is our fate if we build upon Jesus. See, what's, what's the bait of the enemy? What if he doesn't come through for you? Oh, what if, what if, that's wishful thinking. What if God isn't all that? What if God stopped doing these things for his saints? Oh, there's all sorts of things the enemy throws at us. It says that he that believes on him shall not be confounded. Take it to the bank. We will not be moved. No matter what is happening in this world, we will not be shaken by it. Will we be tested? Yes. But that doesn't mean we move from the rock upon which we stand. When bullets start flying, people start screaming. And if bullets started whizzing through this room, how would a room full of Christians respond? 
God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. It says, therefore will not we fear, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, we will not fear. That is immovable. You must know your Savior. You must know what to build upon. And if you build upon the rock, you will not fall. You will not be moved. That is your confidence. It is faith in Him. We believe the Word of God. It says it. It's right. We're fixed. Immovable. We will not budge. When the earth and the sky are peeling away, and just hear the screams. You can hear everyone panicking. You are not. You're fixed to the eternal one, Jesus Christ. And when the winds and the rains beat against you, your house will not fall. Be still and know that I am God. Be fixed, be resolute, be immovable. The earth can peel away, but you are fixed to the God of Jacob. He is your refuge. There is never a bad moment for a Christian. Every moment is an opportunity for leaping and rejoicing. Every single moment. No matter what is happening, God still sits enthroned. And our God wins. Our God wins. Now, I know for many this is challenging. Welcome to Christianity. This is the word of God. How much trouble have you seen? How much trouble have you gotten into because you doubted the word of God? Because your feelings replaced the facts that biblical faith rests in. We've defined it briefly, described it a little. Let me give you more description of biblical faith. It is the conduit through which God's grace flows. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You're saved by grace through faith. We know biblically, Jesus speaking, Mark eleven twenty two, 22. Faith can move mountains. I just don't have any hope, pastor. What you don't have is faith. Because faith brings living hope and moves mountains, per the word of God. Faith displays humility and trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own feelings. But in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight by faith. Faith begets courageous, courageous confidence. Do you realize I can do all things in Christ? Who gives me strength? All things. Courageous confidence by faith. Faith can increase. I told you the disciples say to Jesus in Luke 17, 5. The apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. Your faith has room to grow. Don't you ever lose sight of that. You realize that it was faith that differentiated Noah from his neighbors? Go back to the flood. It's faith that differentiated Noah from his neighbors. How important is that? James 1.6 is very clear. Faith is single-minded. You find yourself double-minded? You got a faith problem. Come back to the truth and love of God's word. Now that's going to challenge many. My perspective here, but it's very sad. Superficial sinners seldom seek supernatural sanctification. Instead, they are tragically satisfied with being tragically satisfied. I just want what I want. Faith is going to be tried and going to go through trials. We've seen that already in verse 6 of 1 Peter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved, you've been distressed by various trials. Adrian Rogers famously said, a faith that hasn't yet been tested cannot be trusted. A faith that has not yet been tested cannot be trusted. 
A lot of wisdom there. You go now with me to verse 7 and you see that test. We know it's true because God's word says, so that the proof or the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, may be revealed. We go through the fires and the trials so that our faith will be tested. And that which is genuine, we saw this last week. Let your, let your heart rest in this. Christian, if you have genuine faith, biblical faith, and you're going through the battle of a lifetime, God's word, not mine, it's not me speaking, God's word says, you, Christian, and your genuine faith, you're going to be praised by the living God. Not my words. Well done, faithful slave. You'll be praised by the living God. You'll be honored by the saints of Hebrews 11. And you'll be glorified in your inheritance by the living God. This is to have and know the victory of faith that awaits those who have by grace. So if you don't have this, cry out to Christ. Please, Lord Jesus, save my soul. Please, Lord Jesus. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Seven word prayer from a tax collector that Jesus said, here's your example. I was blessed to share at Wayne Needle's memorial yesterday. And I thought, what a beautiful portrait. Humble, simple. I love the Lord Jesus. I've shared with you this stairway to heaven. Love, believe, obey, rejoice, repeat. Love, believe, obey, rejoice, repeat. This stairway to heaven is made up of gracious and glorious single steps of faith. According to the word, the will, and the ways of God. I pray this victory will be yours. Listen again to a perspective that I pray inspires. So we have three characters. Fact, faith, and experience. And they're all commissioned to walk the ridgepole of a barn. But this isn't just any old ridge pole. This is like an extremely steep one, almost like a razor sharp edge. And every single one of us looking at it, we go, you can't do that. Even the, those tightrope walkers, you can't walk a razor blade. I mean, that's, that's impossible. And yet, fact gets out there and without even wobbling, just walks it, pulls off the impossible. All of us are just standing by going, whoa. In comes faith. Faith is mystified at the power of fact. And faith, get this, as long as he keeps his eyes focused on fact, in awe and wonder, maintains balance and walks the ridge fall. Now, life would be very nice and easy if that's the way it was, but there's a third character. See, this third character poses a few problems for us because you know where you're at in this story? Your faith. When faith follows fact, and I know fact isn't the typical word we use for it in Christianity. We call it truth. We call it the word of God. When faith follows the word of God, when faith follows truth, when faith follows fact, faith maintains balance and pulls off the impossible. But there's a third character. And this third character is a nuisance. This third character's name is experience. You could also call this third character emotion. We have this loud mouth in our life that is always clawing for our attention. It's how you feel. It's what you've gone through in your past. Experience is a loud mouth. And when faith consults experience, what happens? Experience falls off the ridge pole and so does faith. You know that manure pile at the bottom of the barn that you've spent a good deal of your life in? Sick and tired of that? You see, God didn't intend you to be at the bottom of the barn in a manure pile. But the reason is, is you keep listening to experience. You keep listening to your emotions as if you can define reality. You don't define fact. You don't define truth. The secret to faith is to follow fact. So you have a
experiences. You're coming in with some baggage. And you're used to listening to experience. You know what modern Christianity is? Modern Christianity is turning around and consulting experience and defining our doctrines instead of on fact based on what we've all experienced. And you can say, well, what are you saying? Experience doesn't matter? No, I'm actually not saying that. Does God care about our experience? Absolutely. However, experience cannot be your lead. If experience is your lead, you live in manure. However, if fact is your lead, if truth is your lead, faith walks the ridge pole, listen, and experience gains balance. When you start believing the Word of God, your life begins to work and now your experience begins to match up with the fact. See, God intends your life to actually work. He intends your experience to actually walk the impossible life. He does. But the secret to that happening is you must neglect your experience. Your job is to believe the clear word of God. That is what we are. We're called believers. And those who trust in Jesus will never be put to shame. Ever! Ever be put to shame! You trust your God, you grit your teeth! He is faithful. Faith. It refuses to receive the counsel of despair and heed the voice of discouragement. Do you imagine staring at the cross? Even in the apparent seeming defeat and saying, Jesus will win. Jesus will win. Someone can come up to you and how do you feel about your Savior now? Watch what my God will do. You stand there for three days staring at that empty cross saying, watch what my God will do. Watch what my God will do. Grit your teeth, saints of God. Your God will not lose. Hold on in faith. And after three days, the Son of God comes up behind you and puts his hand on your shoulder. You turn to look at him, and he says, well done. Now stand firm knowing what you have gained. I will not lose. And if my saints allow me to be God, they will not be defeated in what I have commissioned them forth to accomplish. If you want to gain the things of heaven, you need to have your faith tested. It needs to be proven and tried by fire. And that's why we must be ready for the Syrophoenician test when God appears to be silent. We must be prepared for the Lazarus test when God appears to have forgotten. We must be prepared for the walking on water test when all the powers of the natural realm seem to be more powerful than anything God could dish out. And we must be prepared for the cross test when even our God, the victorious victor of victors, appears to be defeated. God's looking for gritted teeth. It's called faith. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. If you show cowardice in the moment of testing, if you draw back in that moment, if you flee as a coward and say, I can't stand with God, this is too much, when he's going to constantly be testing me like this, I can't handle it. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Faith isn't wishful thinking. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's fact. You actually have in substance and an evidence in your soul the very reality of that which is promised. You have it. My confidence rests in Him. God has promised, and He cannot lie. If your God has said it, believe Him. Hold to it! Greet your teeth, stand at the cross and say, Watch what my God will do. Watch what my God will do. You will be tested. You will be tried. However, you have Jesus Christ. You need not fear a thing same God that has started the work in you is faithful to complete it. You have what is needed by the grace of God to grit your teeth. Grit your teeth, church. Grit your teeth. Stay out of the manure pile of your feelings. And embrace the facts that biblical faith holds to by the power of the resurrection of Jesus the Christ through the love and the commitment and the blood-bought gift of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. 
and where and when this biblical faith is established, it works. It works. It does the work of God and it's effective and works in times of trial. This is where and when you're ready to deploy this biblical faith. Listen to verse 8 of 1 Peter 1. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him, now you believe in him. Faith loves. Faith believes. Faith is above and beyond your senses. It's supernaturally gifted. And it comes with the spirit of the living God inside of us. Corey Tenenboom says, Faith is like radar that sees through the fog. I ask you, friends, are you seeing through the fog? Are you going like that band of rhinos, 30 miles an hour, seeing 30 feet in front of them with 8,000 pounds apiece, saying, watch out because the crash is coming by faith. By faith. I know we've defined, we've described, now I'm encouraging, exhorting you to deploy this faith. Let me circle back around. Lest anybody be confused, let's take a look at the anatomy of this faith that's going to be deployed. Listen carefully, I pray, one more time. Christianity is built on one very basic thing, faith. And without faith, there isn't much left in the whole operation because everything in Christianity that matters operates with it. If you want grace, You need faith. If you want to know God's love and live in God's love, again, it's faith that provides the passport. Salvation? Yep, faith. Victory? Uh Uh-huh, faith. Holiness? Faith. Righteousness? Faith. It says in Hebrews 11, 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Then again in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Oh, and yet again in Ephesians 2, 8, you are saved by grace through faith. It would appear that a lot rests on this idea of faith, and in fact, a lot does. In this whole gospel schematic, faith is the linchpin. If faith is absent, then the gospel is rendered powerless in a human life. Faith is the sole fuel upon which the gospel spark kindles and sets aflame. How does faith function? Faith is an exclusive covenant relationship between the eyesight of the human soul and its lone source of truth, the Word of God. So when you get married, you have a covenant with your eyes. And so let's imagine that this is my wife. Well, my gaze stays on my wife. I don't let the wandering eye roam around this earth and go, you know, it's unfair. There's so many girls on this earth. There's so many things to consider. No, I have an exclusive covenant relationship with my wife. I'm not looking for another girl. Well, why is it that when we come to Christianity, we don't catch the fact that that is what we must do with Jesus Christ? We have an exclusive covenant relationship with our eyes. I make a covenant with my eyes, the eyes of my soul upon the Word of God. I am not wandering looking for other evidence, looking for other truths, looking for other philosophies. I'm not looking elsewhere. I'm looking to the master of worlds, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Jesus Christ. We serve truth and no other philosophy. Faith is exclusivity of thought, deliberate choosing to deafen to the loyalty counsel, railings, accusations, and concerns of the flesh. Faith is the spiritual discerning of God's way and the bold movement forward in it. There is a movement in Christianity towards doubts, and it's cool, actually. You are deemed to have cool points if you say, yeah, I I struggle with believing this stuff, but I still do. You know, some days I believe it, some days I don't. Yeah, it's just the way it works in Christianity. That isn't actually how it works. One of the leading writers today won the Gold Medallion Award for his book on faith, which says that doubt is the skeletal structure on which faith grows. Uh, No, it does not set on a skeletal structure of doubt. It sets on the skeletal structure of promise. Faith is based on something sound and solid. And by the way, you don't want to try and stand on doubt in a day of testing. It is not going to hold you up. Doubt is what kills faith. What are we doing in Christianity? Faith is the essence of how we move forward and triumph in Christianity, and yet we are celebrating that which kills it. It's like a novocaine to the soul of the modern Christian. Our 
job is to believe, not to doubt. A lot of people feel that they're a victim to doubt. Sort of like, I have no choice in it. I just doubt. I wish I didn't doubt, but oh, I doubt. As if it's a personality issue. I'm going to say something and just lay it on the line for you and let you squirm in your seat a little. Doubt is a sin. To doubt God is to believe the word of the devil instead of the word of God. You see, you're believing something. Doubt is not necessarily unbelief in the sense that you don't believe something. It's that you're siding against one to believe the other. And when you doubt God and you doubt his word, you are believing the devil. You are taking his evidence as if it were fact. And as a result, you are siding against and turning your back on that which is true. You need to understand the seriousness of what we're dealing with. We do not play with doubt. You are not a victim to doubt. You have been duped by the devil into doubt. So, what do you do? What do you believe? Faith is complete and utter confidence in the ability of God to perform that which he has promised to perform. It does not waver or hesitate, cower or retreat, even in the face of the most gross and insurmountable natural obstacles. Faith is wholly given to the opinion of God and trusts it implicitly. Faith is fiercely loyal to the word of God, and even at the risk of public ridicule, it is willing to put all its chips on God and live. God is leading you. You do not need to heed what the evidence is on the enemy's side of the ledger. No wavering. Keep your eyes focused on what God is saying. If you're going to weigh the evidence of God, you turn towards the Word of God. What do you do? Behold. It means to see, to discern, to inspect, and to examine. Are you looking at His evidence? That's what you're supposed to be doing. This is God's Word. God's Word is fact. It is true. There is no lie in it. It is as silver, gold, purified seven times over. There is no flaw in it. It is without flaw. Christians, God is the God of the impossible. What we do as modern Christians, we have a tendency to diminish the promise of God because we evaluate it based on its plausibility. I don't care about its plausibility. I care about if God promised. That's how faith works. What's happened to this sort of faith? The sort of faith that just takes God's word and says, I believe it. If God promised, he's able to perform it. So when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Will he find this substance that literally gives itself wholly and fully to the word of truth, to the promises of God? God sets before you the evidence of the kingdom. And he says, do you see it? Supernaturally, your soul has been awakened and you see it. He lays it before you and you repent of your old thinking and you give yourself holy and say, I trust you. And that's the act of believing. We believe our God's evidence. Faith is that evidence. It's not wishful thinking. I have a concrete confidence in my God's ability. Where are you? Where are you in your understanding of this biblical faith? Do you recognize that true biblical faith, it works? When we talk about deploying, it's bringing this faith into your life's experiences. Let it be at the core, the fountain of your witness. You'll also not only see this faith at work, you'll see it worship. Here in our passage, if you look at the second half of verse 8, you see again a overflow of this genuine faith. If you have this genuine faith, you will greatly rejoice, even though for a little while you're grieving. You will greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible. Get that? Your joy will be beyond words. You'll rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible. I can't tell you how blessed I am. I can't get it out of me. I wish I had words. 
You're just going to have to see God alive in me. It's inexpressible and more, it's full of glory. Your rejoicing will be filled with a joy that is beyond words and a glory to God that is undeniable. Now I ask you friends, you think it might help to get in tune with this biblical understanding of faith and put to death that manure pile of your feelings that are taking you away from the facts of this biblical faith. Listen to verse 9 because here it gets even better. This biblical faith, it doesn't just work, it doesn't just worship, it wins. We win you will see, quote, the obtaining as the outcome of your faith, you're going to obtain, you're going to receive as an outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It doesn't get any better than this. Biblical faith will obtain the outcome of the salvation of your souls by grace through the gospel, for the glory of God. Tell me that there is anything that you feel or have heard that is better than that. You can't. And if you think you can, you've bought into a lie. This is the truth and love of God's word. Let me just wash over you again some of God's scripture. Faith directs our steps, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith empowers our prayer, Matthew 21, 22. Verses tell us, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Ask for what God wants you to have, and you'll have what you want. Faith trusts God no matter what. Nothing will be impossible with our God. Luke 1.37 Faith humbles and sobers the true Christian. Romans 12.3 Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned you. Faith fights the good fight and runs God's race, 2 Timothy 4.7. Faith exudes a still confidence that is supernatural. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God by faith. Faith abides, 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13. it will be there, it will stay the course. Faith is used to justify us, Galatians 2.16. Again, it's that marriage with the saving grace of God. 1 Corinthians 16.13, faith stands firm. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. God's word. Faith really believes. For if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved by faith through grace. Faith empowers daily living. Romans 1.17, Habakkuk 2.4. The faithful, righteous live by faith. Faith will grow. We see it in the example of Romans 4, 20 and 21 where we're told about Abraham whose faith was attested to be the blessing and which grew strong as he gave glory to God. Many of you know the verse on the back of my business card, John three thirty six. For those who believe, those who have faith have life. Faith will lead unto eternal life. Those who have faith, those who believe have life. Those who do not obey, faith obeys. Do not have life, but instead the wrath of God abides on them. Friends, I give you one more portrait of faith in action. And then I'm going to leave you with a verse that I pray you'll tuck deep down in your heart. And will always come back to when you struggle. But listen to this portrait of victory with faith winning. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. There has to be something known as faith. And it's sort of hard to describe how faith works because I can't 
stick it in you. You can't stick it in yourself. You haven't. God is giving it to you. And so without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. You see, he is is the name of God. It's the proper name of God. In the, in the Greek, we have this hard, difficult time translating. However, God in the Old Testament introduces his proper name at the burning bush to Moses. Moses says, who am I to tell them? Sent me. I am that I am. You see, God says, I am. We say, he is. It is basically saying God is, which means he was, he is, and he always will be. He's unchanging, he's immutable. The way he was then is the way he will be now. God doesn't change. So when you understand him, you can bank on it. You can stand on it as rock. But it's not just that you believe he is. You believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is the basis of faith. These are two of the facts. Those are incontrovertible facts. And you can build your life around them. Once you know it, a billion years from now, it's still true. This is who God is. God does not change. There is no shadow of turning in Him. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. That's the equivalent of saying, He is the I Am. Did you know that God cannot violate His nature? He is. So therefore, who he is will always be who he is. And guess what? It says in scripture that he is truth, which means there is no lie in him. And it says in scripture that he cannot lie, he will not lie. God is not a man that he should lie. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? The strength of Israel will not lie. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So can God lie? No! You declare that in your soul. This is the movement or the action of faith. My God has no falseness in him. My God cannot mislead. My God is truth. So do you believe the word of God is, in fact, the word of God? Look what it says in scripture. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So he is, he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He cannot lie. The word of God is the word of God. And therefore, get this, this is the logic. The word of God cannot lie. God cannot lie. And if this is his word, what do you know about it? It's truth. It would have no falseness in it. Aha, uh -huh. you just unlocked the door to faith. Walk in as a little child Start participating in the Word of God with a whole new confidence. God cannot lie. His Word is in fact His Word. And therefore it bears His nature. It cannot, will not, is unable to lie. It is in fact truth. Faith stems from this list that I'm giving you. You catch this as a little child in your soul and suddenly your faith works. How can you be so certain? Because the God that I am trusting in has declared it, and he cannot lie. Ian e. Bounds, one of my favorite writers on prayer, says, Jacob wrestled not so much with a promise as with the promiser. See, this isn't just a promise. It's not an impersonal concept. This is a person. You are trusting God. It's his character that is at stake. Jacob, in the dark of the night, he was at his wit's end. He had nowhere else to turn. And he grabbed a hold of God. And he would not let go. Who do you need to grab on to? Jesus. Faith is grabbing on to Jesus. Not just turning, but grabbing, clinging, and saying, you have what I need. I trust you, I will not let go. You know where the name Israel comes from? That's it. That is the name of God's people throughout the ages. So what are they known for? Grabbing a hold of God. Grabbing a hold of the person. That is your job. Grab a hold of God and do not let him go. The promiser. He cannot lie. He will not change. He is the same forever. And he is eager to answer. There are four facts that will change your life right there. That's what faith is made up of right there. He cannot lie. So if he ever speaks, you see, he cannot lie, but could you imagine if he never gave us his word? We could believe that he doesn't lie, but he never gave us anything to believe in. We 
just know he doesn't lie. But he cannot lie, but he's also promised. And he's promised and he will not change, and he's the same forever, which means his promises are sure. It's not like he just promised way back then, but his promises are an extension of his nature. He is who he is. He cannot lie. And so when he promises, they are secure promises. They are true. He is eager to answer. The Christian life that is marked by faith does not waffle. It does not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but believes that what God has promised, he is able also to perform. What does it say in Romans 4? Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. If God said it, then I believe he's able to perform it. I have faith in the word of God. Why? Eric, how could you have such confidence? It cannot lie. Well, how do you know God just didn't lie back then, but now he might start lying today? Because he is, and he cannot change. And so therefore, when I know he cannot lie, then he also cannot lie today. My confidence is in something sure. The Bible calls it a rock. It's a rock beneath our feet, and when we build our life upon it as a wise man, we can endure any difficulty in this life and stand firm any difficulty if and when we'll live by faith walk by faith love by faith witness by faith all of these promises of God come to us hear me church from the very beginning till right now today the greatest problem and the greatest potential in the professing church has been and remains faith. A.W. Tozer said that true faith rests upon the character of God. Think about that. When you embrace this biblical faith, it does not bring an easy promise. It does, however, bring an eternal promise. And that makes all the difference. All the difference. I pray you come to understand and embrace having been washed over by the word of God, concentrated on Christ-like faith, biblical faith, genuine faith. This is the essence of the passage that we've been in in early part of 1 Peter 1. We can rejoice no matter what because we have a faith that is grounded in the no matter what gospel of Jesus Christ. His gracious stairway to heaven his glorious stairway to heaven is climbed by one gracious step of faith at a time. See it. Own this truth and know that it comes from this same God. Again, Galatians 5, you've been given, Christian, the gift, the fruit of faith. You don't have to go find it. You need to tap into it if you're a Christian. You can't buy it, you can't earn it, you can't make it. And you can't deny that it's in you if you are a child of God. That's the promise of our God. And know that it is his. Exodus 34, verse 6. If you write things down in your Bible, this is one to put there. If you've got a tablet or a pen, write it on your palm. Don't ever lose this truth in love. The Lord passed before Moses, and the Lord proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Some of your translations will say truth. Abounding in, overflowing with steadfast faithfulness. Hold that truth by the grace of God through the power of the gospel and for the glory of God. 
and you will know the victory that is biblical faith. Oh Lord, I pray that each one within the sound of my voice will hear you, know you, surrender to you, celebrate you, worship you, serve you in every way possible. By grace, through faith, may there be nothing else satisfying in their lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to share three songs of closing worship and I'm going to be here. If anybody would like to be prayed with or prayed for, know that here in Maryland, we're going to seek to have an elder up front at the end of every message. So if there's a need for, a desire for prayer, we'll be available by grace through faith. Amen.